What follows is the full, uncropped interview that I videotaped to respond to the questions that church militants sent me concerning the Wyoming Carmelites, known as the Coffee Monks, because of their mystic monk coffee. I don't have a camera handy tonight, so I'm just adding this audio as a quick introduction because Church Militant will be releasing the short interview tomorrow morning, September 6, 2022, with a link at the end to this full interview. In 2018, a young man named Joseph from Alabama had discovered my Marian News YouTube channel and was intrigued that I had been in Carmel as a nun. He was discerning a monastic vocation and began emailing me with a few questions. He had been attracted by the advertisements of the coffee monks for vocations. I tried to persuade him to discern with several other Carmels because I knew the founding father of the Wyoming Carmelites very well, and I had grave reason to suspect that he was not giving his men a balanced religious formation. But the coffee monks had an alluring website and put a heavy emphasis on the need for men to do a come-and-see visit. Joseph signed up and joined about eight other young men who were also discerning. The come and see was carefully orchestrated to convince almost all of them that they needed to enter Carmel as soon as possible to follow God's will. I was concerned that Joseph could be running headlong into trouble, but I could not offer solid evidence at that time that anything was wrong inside those cloister walls. In a few months, we bade farewell, not expecting to have any more communication after he entered the cloister. Sadly, I received an email from him not long after his great day of entrance. He was devastated with what he had discovered there and quite crushed, uncertain why he was unhappy there and fearing that he was the problem because that's what he was told. From this point, we began conversing on the phone, and I got a very clear picture of what was going on inside that community. I took extensive notes and wrote a letter to the bishop in Wyoming, urging him to use his authority to conduct a proper visitation. Meanwhile, Joseph was eager to pursue his vocation in an authentic monastic setting, and I am happy to say that he ended up in one of the monasteries that I recommend at the end of this video. After waiting in vain for many months for the bishop to acknowledge my letter, I sent my concerns to Church Militant. By the time my information reached them, they were already doing a spotlight interview with Augustine, another young man who was devastated by what, by what he encountered there. The spotlight report was released around February, and this summer certain persons began making public efforts to discredit Augustine's testimony. So Church Militant reached out to witnesses like myself who could provide more insights about what was really going on with the coffee monks. I kept reminding Church Militant to put quotations around my name because at this point I am not officially a sister, but dispensed from my vows to the Carmelite order, yet not established in a new order of the Mother of God. The rule that Melanie received from Our Lady of La Salette states that the charism will be to preach reform of hearts. Melanie saw that there will be houses of this order established expressly for the care of religious who have lost their early fervor and have become half-hearted in charity and zeal. Melanie saw in vision that this new order would help many religious orders and congregations to regain their lost fervor. Bishops have a canonical but limited role in the oversight of religious communities. It's really only religious who can reform religious. You wouldn't expect a CEO of a business franchise to revive a failing baseball team. The secular clergy have a totally different vocation than religious clergy because they are called to a radical evangelical life lived out in community. This new order of the Mother of God will have the heart of the mother who wants her sons and daughters to win their spiritual battles, and this requires discipline. For those of you who are like me and prefer to work while listening to videos, I will read out loud the questions that appear silently on the screen. Sister Anne was a Discalced Carmelite nun for 33 years. Her Lake Elmo Carmel was near the Lake Elmo Hermitage, 
where Father Daniel Mary did his novitiate in the 1990s and was ordained. She knew him well. I first met him in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. That would be 1992. Although we were close to the same age, he was a postulant then, but I had 13 years under my belt. I had just arrived, having transferred from the Carmel in Missouri. In that year, John Paul allowed all the Carmelites to reshuffle in monasteries according to their choice of constitutions because he approved two and then three sets of constitutions once the updated legislation occurred according to the new code of canon law. I joined the Carmel of Lake Elmo without realizing that it featured the rare bonus of a new community of hermits nearby ready to serve as chaplains. A month after I arrived, Brother Daniel Mary and Brother Gregory received the habit. In those early years, both communities were small, so we enjoyed recreating at the parlor grate on feast days. As the communities grew, we cut back to meeting only on solemnities. Some brothers were always quiet, but Brother Daniel Mary was the life of the party, telling stories from his cowboy days growing up in Wyoming. When I became portress, I got to know some of his family. They had more stories. He loved to dress up, he loved to ride in the rodeo, and he got into scrapes and landed in jail. I assumed it was for rowdy conduct. The whole family seemed rowdy to me. Question, what was your role at the Lake Elmo Carmel? Because of my selling skills, I was immediately assigned as assistant and successor to the nun who made habits and vestments for the hermits. They had to be fitted in person, so they stood at the enclosure door and we'd engage in small talk while pinning their hems. I served as their vesture for 13 years, and for nine of those years I was answering the door and phone, which included interaction with the brothers. Nuns don't see the visitors, but converse at a revolving platform on which visitors can set groceries or prayer requests. I became even more involved with them when the prioress allowed me to offer my computer skills as their liturgy assistant. From this vantage point, I was privy to what you might call monastic gossip, usually expressed indirectly. Brother so-and-so was late again. Brother X blew up again. Brother X would be Father Daniel Mary. Faults of his temperament, though, were not overtly evident before his profession of vows because he spent several years away in Massachusetts at the Holy Apostle Seminary, and if novices wanted to be voted for profession, they behaved themselves. Question. In your letter to Bishop Stephen Bigler, you noted, after ordination, Father Daniel Mary didn't want to do ordinary work. What do you mean? He loved to preach. He loved to talk. He loved to dress up in mantle or vestments and he liked to dazzle the younger nuns. But the Carmelite life is primarily silence, prayer, and sacrifice. Carmelites are not Dominicans. The hand cannot be the foot or the head. We must be true to our vocation and charism. Otherwise, the mystical body will be deformed. St. Therese expressed it well, that the role of the Carmelite is to be the heart, hidden deep in the body, beating with love and praise and intercession on behalf of those who have an act of apostolate. Father Daniel Mary was often angry with Father Pryor because he was not allowed to travel frequently. Father Pryor himself received numerous invitations to give retreats, but he accepted only three or four a year to safeguard his vocation. His retreat talks stemmed from his life of prayer. Question. The Lake Elmo Carmel made prayer a priority, not construction. Talk about Father Daniel Mary's impatience, his pendulum swings, and the tensions that resulted. I'll just focus on one example. The hermits began with one main building, thanks to the legacy given to them by the parents of Mother Paula. May she rest in peace. The goal was to construct individual wooden hermitages in due time, and someday a freestanding chapel. That was 1992. A few weeks ago, in 2022, 40 years later, they just broke ground on their chapel. Buildings were never a priority. 
They wanted to be faithful to a daily schedule similar to what St. Teresa prescribed for the nuns, a full hour of mental prayer, morning and again in the evening, the full divine office, spiritual reading, classes for novices, and an hour of community recreation after supper. Silence is maintained during the day with work done in solitude as much as possible. Gardening, bread baking, and other daily tasks take up part of the day. Time for construction is last on the checklist. Their vocation has never been compromised for the sake of construction, no matter how long it would take. This is standard procedure for monasteries. Clear Creek Abbey in the Tulsa Diocese is a good example. But the slowness didn't irritate Father Daniel Mary. It was the benefactors. Every once in a while, not often, but people would drop in to ask how things were going. It was a pendulum thing. Sometimes Father Daniel Mary would love to give the tour. Other days he would throw a fit that people were allowed to come near the monastery. He would argue openly, scandalously, disrespectfully with the mild-mannered, ever-patient Father Pryor. Gradually, the hermitages were completed and some areas were reserved for the religious, while visitors could be admitted in other areas. The Father Daniel Mary was always upset on that point. Sometimes he wanted more access to visitors, other times he wanted them all to go away. He would argue that the hermits should have a cloister and a turnstile like the nuns, but it had been decided from the very first that the hermits would never be enclosed. They wanted access to the people for spiritual direction. There is no tradition in the church that I know of, of enclosed men, not even the Camaldolese. It's effeminate, if you think about it. The female, the weaker sex with offspring, is covered and protected by the male. Men stand watch. Question. Talk about Father Daniel Mary's departure from Lake Elmo to start up a new community in Wyoming. As Church Militant has reported, the Diocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, has a troubled history of bishops who favored everything radically left. For years, the poor hermits were a laughing stock in the chancery. Now, unless a religious community is attached to an order, it can be vulnerable to the whims of the local bishop. Father John Mary traveled to Europe several times. The Discalce Carmelite General was opposed to male communities that were not engaged in active ministry. But the general of the Calst Fathers, or called the Ancient Order, had been welcoming several new hermit communities. Back in the 1500s, Carmel split into two branches when the Spanish friars were in need of reform by St. Teresa and John of the Cross. But at that time, the Carmelites in Italy and the Netherlands were fervent, and the two branches have flourished down the centuries side by side. To our great joy, the Father General, Joseph Chalmers, said he would travel from Rome to receive the profession of vows personally. We were all ecstatic, including Father Daniel Mary. It was un an unthinkable honor. We prepared carefully, and I spent many hours doing the layout for the program. Although several of the hermits had professed permanent vows, the status of the vows was contingent on the congregation. On September 28, 2003, the fledgling congregation would dissolve and be reborn as an official entity of the order. The hermits could start signing their names with the initials O. Carm. No bishop would have authority to shut them down. But Father Daniel Mary began to perceive his opportunity of escape. His vows would dissolve that day. He would be free to renew them or to depart. Suddenly, he began backpedaling, making loud proclamations that the hermits were abandoning the discalced saints, that it was a travesty to attach themselves to the Cal's branch. Finally, he announced that he was going home to Wyoming, where good priests were needed. Father Daniel Mary was also novice master at that time and began pressuring his novices to leave with him. One of the novices, Brother Michael Mary, threw in his lot with his novice master. All this was a tornado for the poor hermits, just days before the joyous festivity of the arrival of the Father General from Rome. Most of the sisters were shocked by the news, but I had long been aware of his ongoing belligerence. I was glad to see him go, and I shared the hermit's feeling of relief. Question. Father Daniel Mary is accused of misrepresenting his community. How so? And why did Bishop Ricken get an angry phone call from the Discalce Father General in Rome? 
When Father Daniel Mary arrived in Wyoming, he started sweet-talking Bishop Ricken, who gave him permission to start a community. The previous winter, the Lake Elmo hermits had encouraged Brother Joseph Marie to return home because they said he was emotionally unstable. Father Daniel Mary began contacting the rejected Lake Elmo vocations to establish a psychological bond with young men. I personally don't think there is sexual bonding going on inside the Wyoming community, but a very warped psychological bonding. Bishop Ricken soon ran into a canonical difficulty because a new congregation must demonstrate a new and distinct charism for the church. Father Daniel Mary had only expressed a desire to be an authentic Theresian Discalce Carmelite. Noticing that Latin Mass families generated vocations, he suddenly declared that his charism was to be a Tridentine Carmel. In Lake Elmo, Father Pryor was fluent in Latin, but Father Daniel Mary had never shown any interest in the language or the liturgy. Now he began touring the country to appear on shows, boasting that his community was the only authentic male discalced Carmel and it was returning to the old Carmelite rite. It would take a separate video to discuss his travesty of the Carmelite rite. Rumors reached Rome itself, and Bishop Ricken was told to rein in the madman. Question. Talk about how he slandered the Minnesota community. Well, next, Father Daniel Mary decided he could divert potential vocations from applying at Lake Elmo by slandering his former brothers. Malicious gossip reached the Archbishop of St. Paul, Minneapolis, who angrily called in Father John Mary to demand an accounting of his supposedly scandalous conduct. Father John Mary was easily able to demonstrate the falsehood of every accusation. After the slander incident, the nuns in Lake Elmo banned the very name of Daniel Mary from conversation. Friends and benefactors of both Lake Elmo communities, who had liked Father Daniel Mary, were now horrified by the things he invented against his prior. I don't think people in Minnesota buy much coffee from Wyoming. Question. What happened that led Bishop Ricken to ban Father Daniel Mary from fundraising in the diocese? The slander trick was the last straw for Bishop Ricken. His friendship toward the monks completely cooled. He forbade Father Daniel Mary to solicit donations in his diocese. So how could they build their grandiose Gothic monastery without funds? This crisis was the catalyst for the coffee business and the mystic monk commercials. Problem number one, why had he been soliciting donations? St. Teresa of Avila's constitutions forbids the asking of alms. She taught that a genuine vow of poverty is dependence on God. If we keep the rule, God will keep us. And if he chooses not to feed us, we can die in peace. If religious have an active apostolate and need funds to build a school or hospital, it's on their conscience to beg men or God. But Carmelites who only want to pray and just need a bit of straw to sleep on and bread to eat, where was his trust in God? Problem number two. Why did he want a huge Gothic monastery complex? St. Teresa of Avila absolutely insisted on poverty and simplicity in Carmelite buildings. Quote, If I may say what my conscience bids me, I should wish that on the day when you build great edifices, they may all fall down and kill you all. That's in her book, The Way of Perfection. This is not to criticize the magnificent structures of other religious orders that give glory to God. It's about being true to your charism. Now what if a lieutenant in the army kept demanding that he be given a ship instead of a jeep? Father Daniel Mary pretends to be discalced. It's a total farce. Question. Do you believe the Wyoming Monastery website is deceptive? And this deception is used to lure unsuspecting postulants like Joseph, the young man you helped? I can't speak about the website, which I had no reason to visit. Anyway, I understand it's been modified since Church Militant Spotlight was released. But my mother innocently sent donations to the Wyoming Carmel for quite a few years, and she had a collection of their glossy newsletters. I've done thousands of layouts with state-of-the-art software, but the brochure pictures from the monastery were completely baffling to me. Which portions were existing structures and which portions were the architect's projection? 
nor did the brochures make it clear how many brothers actually lived there. It was a clear message to me that the membership was unstable and in continual flux, and the brothers wanted to pretend, in the early years at least, that candidates would enter a fully built structure. Joseph was in the monastery for only 10 days. Talk about some of the serious failures in religious observance he witnessed there, including he never saw monks praying the divine office. The liturgy is the life of a religious. What would you think of a priest who didn't celebrate Mass? The early desert monks memorized all 150 psalms. The divine office is the prayer of the church. We profess vows to pray it, all of it, every day until we die. This prayer is our greatest service to the world. It is Christ who prays in us and with us. We almost ran to choir when the bell rang, like a person in love eager to meet the beloved. A community that doesn't pray the office is salt that has lost its savor, useless to be thrown and trampled underfoot. Joseph said the Carmelites were not given time to pray the rosary. Carmelites pray and wear a six-decade rosary. Centuries before the Immaculate Conception was a dogma, Carmelites added that extra decade, asking God that it would become a dogma. A karma without the rosary is a counterfeit Carmel. Joseph said there was no daily recreation, contrary to St. Teresa's counsel. So what was happening on the weekdays? Perpetual silence? No, the opposite. Joseph said it was continual chatter in the workhouse. I mean, the coffee house. The human psyche naturally needs social interaction. When time isn't set aside for regular recreation, then people start talking during the rest of the day. Joseph said that postulants were given no time for spiritual reading. Instead, they were told to sacrifice that time. Lexio Divina is listening to one's beloved to learn more and more about God. St. Teresa told her prioresses that it was more important to buy good books for the nuns than to buy food. Joseph said the monks ate meat for over 10 years, placing manual labor and protein needs above the authentic Carmelite rule. It's beyond hypocritical for them to boast of being discalced. The cows can eat meat three days a week. This concession was granted in the Middle Ages at the time when people were weakened by the great plagues. The discalced restored the old observance of total abstinence. No meat, not even turkey on Thanksgiving. No meat in Carmel, period. Protein is in fish, beans, eggs, and dairy. There is even protein in bread. Who lives longer than monks and nuns? Meat is tastier, it's a temptation, it's a distraction. Question. In your letter to Bishop Stephen Bigler, you noted the way Father Daniel Mary ran the Wyoming Carmelite. By pressuring monks to work all day as, quote, founding members, and the published horarium was deceptive and greatly truncated, and that Joseph was denied even one hour of mental prayer per day, and postulants were told to stop thinking and obey blindly. I think all those points are self-evident nonsense, except I want to say a word about blind obedience. Blind obedience is a sin, not a virtue. No one, not even the Pope, can tell me to do something that my conscience says is sinful. No soldier can obey blindly. If his captain orders him to kill civilians or anything unethical, the soldier cannot say that he's just following orders. If a brother is being ordered to do something that is not consistent with the constitutions to which he has or is preparing to take vows to observe, then he has to question. He has to pause. There are ample canonical channels for a brother to report a problem with a superior. But if novices aren't given access to that documentation, they need to get out and go home. The new Mount Carmel has been under construction for over 10 years. Is it true that Father Daniel Mary is thinking of building another monastery in Canada? Joseph is my source about a potential Canadian foundation. For Father Daniel Mary, a community equals a building. Is the Catholic Church a building? Of course not. It's a living body whose head is Christ. A religious community doesn't exist to build and maintain stone structures. That's absurd. 
unless the structures are being built to maintain somebody's ego. Question. Why is it so hard for former novices to speak out against abuses? Imagine yourself joining the Navy. Do you know what it means to be a sailor? You have some broad ideas, but you expect to be taught in detail. You don't even know the names of rank, let alone the difference in duties. We enter institutions almost like blank slates. If an officer told you to do 20 push-ups every hour on the hour, would you know whether this was sadistic abuse coming from one man or the standard way to build strength and discipline? The novices might be sure that a few things were definitely wrong, but they don't feel certain that it was terribly wrong or that they are qualified to make a judgment. And who do they tell when the superiors were the problem? And if you tell people outside the monastery, it might scandalize them, and they would get the idea that all religious are crazy hypocrites. Ex-novices don't know if their companions might eventually depart also, or how they would connect with them. Most novices remain silent after they leave a community. I didn't talk about my first disastrous come and see experience with a nutty caramel. Question. Why do you think this new crop of former novices has launched a smear campaign against Augustine? Crop is a key word in that question. Religious vocations are very personal. They don't grow in clusters. Brothers rarely know each other before they arrive. If they don't persevere, that decision is individual, not a group mutiny. So how did this crop of former novices connect with one another to smear Augustine? It doesn't take rocket science to figure out that they were recruited by the coffee monks for the sake of damage control. The Carmel could not refute the testimony of Augustine, so the next best thing is to find some ex-novices to go before a camera and say, well, it really wasn't that bad when I was in Carmel. Really, brother? Then why did you leave? because you did not receive a good formation to understand the beauty of your vocation. You don't even know what you threw away when you walked away. Question. Why do you care about this issue? And why are you speaking out? Because I love all monks and want their conversion. Jesus never criticized obvious sinners like Herod, Pilate, or even Sadducees. They weren't worth his time. Jesus came down hard on the best and most fervent group of Jews, the Pharisees, because they were trying to be holy and Satan was working overtime to get them off track. Jesus said that the truth will set us free. The devil has worked much harder to destroy religious communities in the past century than all the temptations and slander he has thrown at the secular priesthood and marriage. Where are the thousands of sisters who used to see in schools and hospitals? I'll be talking about what happened on my channel. God has a great revival in store for religious life. For 20 centuries, most congregations are connected to one of six major rules. Each rule came at a moment of crisis to revive the church. Our Lady gave us a new rule, the seventh rule at La Salette. It's for our time of crisis, and it's beyond exciting. Question. How do young people discern the rule they are called to, and how do they find a good community? When a young man feels certain that God has called him to the vocation of marriage, God doesn't throw a girl into his lap. No, he must now begin the search for a good wife, and this becomes his opportunity to deepen communion in prayer with the Holy Spirit to guide him. Of course, he can foolishly walk into a bar and date the first girl he meets. But the proper path is to make discreet inquiries in proper places where he is likely to find a woman who shares his values and interests. When he is sufficiently satisfied, he begins courtship, the next phase of discovering whether this marriage has been made in heaven. It's the same process with religious life. You don't start by hopping on the internet to sign up for a come and see. That risks putting your emotions first and falling in love with the people you meet there rather than loving their values and interests, namely the charism of their order and congregation. The first duty is to make discreet inquiries. Read the lives of some saints from different congregations to get a flavor of the charisms and learn what the Spirit is saying to your heart. 
all the rules, engage in all the ministries, but it's their special charism that determines where they put the emphasis. I love the Franciscan saints, though I would never have felt comfortable in a Franciscan community. On the other hand, I desperately wanted to be a Dominican because I loved study, but I never felt peace except when I thought about the Carmelite saints. If you spend sufficient time in prayer and study, you'll be ready to start a courtship by asking for the first date, the first meeting with a particular community. I had a horrible experience with my first come and see, but that honed my parameters, and I was able to be much more specific about the kind of questions I would ask before visiting the next monastery. Question, which Carmelite contemplative communities would you recommend? There are excellent Carmelite contemplative communities in the United States. First of all, don't be put off by the word hermit. The Carmelite tradition only uses the term friars and hermits for the male branches. Father Daniel Mary invented monks. Carmelite friars and hermits engage in a serious prayer life and live in community. While there is always an emphasis on the solitary meeting with God, like the cave of Elijah, Carmelites pray more often in the solitude of their cell than in chapel before the Blessed Sacrament. Benedictines, for example, on the other hand, find God above all in Lectio Divina. The word hermit only expresses that these men do not engage in Carmelite, excuse me, in active apostolates, like serving in parishes or schools. Liturgy is very important to hermits, so you will find an appreciation for traditions in Carmelite devotions, and this includes some Latins. The first to recommend is Carmelite Hermits of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Lake Elmo, Minnesota. Second on my list is the Hermits of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel at Cristobal, Texas. And number three, I recommend the Hermits of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Fairfield, Pennsylvania. Now the list for the ladies is much more difficult to navigate since there are about 70 female monasteries in the USA. A religious vocation is not rare, but it is rare in today's culture of noise and distraction to hear that vocare, that call. God may be calling you. Pay attention or you'll miss a wonderful life.